This is J.J. Dillon, the leader of the original Four Horsemen, and this is InYourHeadOnline.com. All right, we're back. Welcome to In Your Head Wrestling Radio. I'm the Internet icon, handsome Jackie Jones, along with my right-hand man. Daydream believer and a homecoming queen. One inch biceps, the power go. <laughs> oh. Well, you know, I've always believed in a daydream, so that would make you my homecoming queen. Oh, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm blushing right now, Jack. Oh, excellent. And joining us for his third appearance here on the show, all the way from Kayfabe Commentaries, we have Sean Oliver back with us. Has it been three? It's the third one, yeah. Uh, three in five years, I guess. That's, mm -hmm. that's okay. That's not overexposure by any means. No. Well, you say three in five years, but it's really been three in like uh, six months, I think. Oh, I, was I, uh, I, thought, I thought I was on a long time ago. I don't know. Mm. Sorry, it might have been three. <laughs> We, we always planned enjoy it talking five years all. ago, but it happened about six months ago. Maybe I was on your horror movie podcast five mm. years ago. Who knows? We'll just pretend. How have you guys been? <laughs> I'm doing fine. How are you doing, Inch Man? I'm doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. It's good times. We'll let everybody know you've got a big DVD out there. It just came out today, I believe. And that is Being a Four Horseman with J.J. Dillon. Being a Horseman, yeah. It's just. It's something a, a little experimental, a little different. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. Um, I, it was so different from anything that we'd ever done and anything that had ever been done in the shoot DVD market. I, I, I kind of, it was very difficult for me to explain for a very long time, even to, um, you know, the people at Kayfabe Commentaries. I, I couldn't even articulate my vision for this. Um, and each time I would start, it would disintegrate into into my not to being far too nebulous in my mind uh, to nail down. So I, I I would just say, yeah, just just trust me, just just trust me. We just have to do this. Just trust me. And um, you know, even after we shot it, uh, it, it was kind of unclear what I wanted to do. But I saw this very clearly from the moment I thought of it, and and. A shoot sim, a shoot simulation is the only nutshell term that I found to describe what being a horseman is. It's a little bit shoot interview, but it's a little bit something else. You know, maybe it's it's in the family of a simulation video game. I don't know. It walk, I, yeah. I was going to say, it walks, it walks you through, you know, what like a, t oh, a typical week would be for the horseman, you know, at that, like the, in their prime. Yeah, I mean... I'm I'm a real mark for for the minutia for 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 details about wrestling. How the hell many times can you can you see a DVD or watch a show or listen to a show? That just kind of talks about the things we know already. I know who the members of the Horsemen were. I I know why Arn was great, and I know why Lex wasn't. You know, um, <laughs> but. But what don't we know that we would want to know? And I think the answer to that is, what bar did you go to on Monday night, February 23rd, 1987, when your chartered flight got back to Charlotte? Mm -hmm. What did Flair do in the bar that night? What was Arn <laughs> drinking? What hotel were you going to stay at when you flew to Minneapolis? Would anyone go see Vern when you were there? Who did workouts during the day before the show that night? What time would you get out of the show? How long did Flair take to get out? Did he really not wear anything under the robe on the plane? Those details, the, as the life, a week in the life of the horseman. Now, I, since this company started five years ago, it's been our goal to try and build the perfect time machine. And we've tried with the various forms of programming we do. And... I think we got the closest with this one. Um, you know, we have a, a clock that flashes on the screen periodically as you go through the week. And through graphics and a, a complex sound design, uh, we wanted to create a simulation uh, to put you in the lock. If we're talking about what goes on in the locker room because we're before the show starts in uh, in Richmond, uh, we, we have a bed of, of, uh, of locker room ambience, 
and some graphics, and I just kind of wanted to, while we listen to J.J. Dillon, um, the riveting and well-spoken historian who takes us back in time with the horsemen, I wanted to add another element of it where something would play very quietly on your senses as you're watching it. And hopefully it accomplished that. You, uh, so far, the, re- the reviews have been great. I know uh, I know you guys got a copy, I think. Mm-hmm. Didn't you? Yep, uh-huh. definitely. I want to thank you for that. And, uh, uh, yeah, yeah we're saying, like you're saying, they have the, the ambiance uh, in the locker room and when the, they're talking about in the hotel and talking about at the, uh, the airport. Little, uh, just a little something extra you don't see on a, on a typical shoot. Uh-huh. And, uh, some, something you brought up was about how, you know, how detailed it is. And I always thought that was kind of how the timeline series goes. And this is, you know, one week. And, uh, obviously you couldn't go with that detailed into it like a regular shoot over someone's whole career, or else it would be, uh, you know, days long instead of hours long. And, uh, yeah. What would be the, the drink of choice for, uh, Sean Oliver? Um, I, I usually like if I'm at a kind of a standard uh, standard place, uh, and I'm not going for the top top shelf. Uh, a, a Johnny Black on the rocks is uh, is where I usually reside. Mm. A, good, a good Scotch. I'm a Scotch man. Mm-hmm. From what I well, hear, so is in Vince McMahon. He probably liked the cheap shit. <laughs> <laughs> doers. I think he was a doer. Yeah, that's guy. yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah, yeah. it's a hmm. step up from piss. <laughs> hmm. Huh. That's what intro intro is. Nah, I'm not into that, Jack. Oh, I'm sorry. We could uh, use I was... Barb in these situations. So you can I'm, so, I'm sorry. Slap that I... label on him. I was flustered here for a second because someone called in here. I think he called in because he heard uh, talks of uh, drinks, and we actually have Gene the Drunk calling in. We haven't heard from him for a while. You know, I, I think the last time we heard from him was when I, I was on last time. I think so. <laughs> He's actually yeah. uh, mentioned in one of the, uh, in, in uh, I think it's the Danny Doring um, liner for the website. He was a big fan of Gene the Drunk. Go on, Gene. Sean Oliver. Sean Oliver. Both, <laughs> both, both times, yep. <laughs> tis, 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 tis. Sean, I haven't received my copy of the Four Horsemen DVD in the mail yet. Uh-oh. Oh, is what this fuck? JJ? I'm sorry, JJ. <laughs> I tried to get a box out to you. I'll have to find out what happened. But, Sean, what I really love and what the guys mentioned is about how you you paint a picture every question you ask for perfect example Flair walks into Bennigan's and he and JJ says he orders a tray of kamikazes and bing the kamikaze tray pops up I thought that was excellent and you know Flair drinks a kamikaze that pops up and then what does Arn drink Arn drinks beer and Tully and JJ likes rum and coke and I thought that was very amusing and interesting and it just keeps you locked into the segment yeah, again, it was something a little different. We tried, and uh, you know, it's it's not something you're going to see on 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 all the series. This is the investigative special umbrella that this falls under. So that kind of gives us a little bit of license in each individual title to try different things. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I wanted to push the uh, I wanted to push the envelope. Go with the graphics. Go with some. I mean, I think at one point when I was playing back some of the samples for the guys here. You know, who thought I was probably going off the deep end as I tucked myself away to edit this thing? I think there's, I think specifically that one you're talking about is about seven tracks of video and probably four tracks of audio um, at that point. But I wanted it to be thick. I wanted it to be, I wanted it to be a real sensory experience. And and I'm I'm glad it was for you, Gene. Um, did it inspire you to open a kamikaze or a poor kamikaze, rather, or open a beer? Was it a total sensory experience for you, Gene? Did the video well, drive you to drink, is what he says. I, act, I actually skipped out on my AA meeting, called my sponsor and told him to go fuck himself, went to the bar, had a couple of kamikazes. Yeah, mm. <laughs> Uh, this feels like the Jamie Dundee you shoot all over again. <laughs> then when I was done, <laughs> oh, it ain't over then yet. Then when so. I was, then when I was done, 
I got some face walker action with the with them, <laughs> them, them, them the them the face walkers, baby. Them the face walkers. I got China to walk on uh-huh. my face, baby. I don't know that's, how that was not nominated for DVD <laughs> of the year. I'm telling you, that's one of my favorites. The Tony yeah. Atlas were making references. Yeah, yeah, I know. Mm. Yeah, I just want yeah. to bring up, Gene, this is why I don't usually answer your call, like if we have, like, Mr. Wrestling 2 on or somebody like that. Well, mm. I like I like the seat after it's been in the shoe all day long. Mm-hmm. And it's been in the sock. <laughs> Thank you I for calling in, Gene. <laughs> hey. How you doing? Thanks, Gene. You're a good man. Thank you. Hmm. That was an interesting call. <laughs> I was wondering whose like uh, initial idea it was to uh, do this type of a uh, DVD because you you'd have to know that the per- person would have to have like a lot of records of their week. Mm-hmm. Oh, the that's a good question. It, truth be told, is it, I had this designated for Tully. Hmm. And when we approached Tully about it, um, he didn't want to do it. And that's fine. I think Tully's one of, you know, you sometimes hear about wrestlers, or I sometimes have to deal with wrestlers, that um, don't inhabit the same planet as I do when it comes to the salability, marketability, and uh, uh, monetary value that would be associated with their services. Um, Tully is someone that resided on a different planet than I. Uh, So we couldn't meet anywhere in the galaxy. And uh, it was too good an idea just to let go to waste. So, you know, we'd work with JJ a bunch of times, and, and I suspected that he would be able to provide even more insight than any of the one individual members of the Horsemen um, because because he was the manager of the stable. And he was also working in the office at the time. I don't know how many people know that, but he was working in the office at Crockett. So he could kind of speak to the day-to-day life being on the road and in the bars and in the hotels and in the arenas, but then also parallel that with his interaction with the office and the horseman's interaction with the office since he was often the go-between, uh, the legit go-between between, between uh, David Crockett and uh, uh, Jim Crockett, whoever was making a decision, and members of the horseman. When I talked to him about it, it just so happens he had copious notes. I mean, he kept journals every year he worked, and I, I asked him if he could dig out you know any of the research possible we had already done uh, anthony who does all of our research um and is, uh, the other owner of the company had already compiled a ton of stuff um uh, date wise and i needed jj to put life into it i mean i had the cold stuff the cold stuff you know that pops up on the screen in timeline i had that for this for those seven days who worked where they worked um, and you know results and stuff like that, but but I needed to I needed the blood uh, to to come into this, and that's what JJ provided, not just from his memory, but from being able to access that journal and tell me that they spent ten bucks on a cab and ninety two dollars on a hotel, <laughs> and that they chartered a flight here from this airport, and that charter cost them ninety dollars, and they split it five ways. That's the that's the stuff that made this special. You said, uh, you know, you kind of saw this all in your mind. Uh, the finished project, was it pretty much how you envisioned it? Yes, it was. Um, it, it, to the point where, you know, you have to know when to, to put the paintbrush down, you know, or or, or you could overdo it. And it, it got to that point where I had to just step away and say, okay, I, I I think it's thick enough. We, we, I want it to be an experience, but you don't want it to cross over that line into distracting. Um, you want to take somebody on a journey, but you don't want to take them away so much from the discussion on screen because they're going to miss the wonderful details. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I saw it this way, and when it was done, I, 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 I kind of knew it was done, and so then it was easy to kind of move on and call it finished. Mm-hmm. How about the your other guys with you? Uh, were they happy with it? As you said, you couldn't really explain to them, you know, what it was all about when you were making it. 
in the end they were, but mm-hmm. I, I, again, I was kind of short on explanation prior to the shoot. Uh, it was really just to just trust me and go there and let's do this and and trust me and and we finished the interview. We shot for I don't know, maybe three hours, and I knew I had enough there to chop it down to a tight two hours or hour and forty five minutes. And and so we got done. And now remember, there's no graphics popping up or anything mm-hmm. like that when we're talking. It's just it's just details and pouring over these day to day details of seven days in the horseman's lives. So I finish and I feel great about it and excited and I stand up and whatever and Anthony passes me and out of earshot of everyone he says I hope your graphics are gonna be good. <laughs> And now I turned to him and I said, what? The, you didn't think the interview was good? He said, well, it's, it's three hours talking about seven days. I just want to tell you what I'm looking at through the lens. And you guys talked about seven days for three fucking hours. <laughs> I uh, hope you have some good graphics. So I think everyone got a little nervous uh, after the shoot, but I, but I knew I knew there were tremendous nuggets in there for me to, to work with. And I think that everybody was happy with the end result. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, we got some people on the hold here. If you guys want to call in, it's 508-644-8503. What the hell is uh, wrong with them? We've got an Anthony. He's been calling in for about the last hour. He must have a very good uh, question for you. Yes, I do. Speaking of that CM Punk promo from last summer, that's one of the best promos. But I got a question. What's your favorite promo growing up as a wrestling fan? Famous promo? Growing up as a wrestling fan. Um, like CM Punk. <laughs> Uh, any of the Piper promos. Mm. Piper is good. I'm going to meet with him next week. Tell him I think he's great. Um, <laughs> All right. he, it, it, it's time he do one of our shows, damn it. Enough's enough. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, any of the Piper Snooker stuff was... was it was real talking oh, into the building type stuff. I thought Don Morocco was a great promo in his time too, because he did that thing that where he would go down. He would go down to barely a whisper, um, but there was such intensity. There was such intensity that everybody listened. Mm-hmm. I like the funny moment when he was eating donuts. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. Yeah. Uh, we, listen, I was fortunate to watch wrestling in the seventies and eighties, where we had the best promo men ever. I mean, I'll put, I'll hands down, I'll put the top five promo men, whoever we decide that is right now, from the '80s. I'll put them up against anybody in a ring now. Mm, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I think anybody from our, uh, I think we're similar in age, uh, from our age uh, generation here, just uh, grew up loving Roddy Piper. You see it with so many of the Piper wrestlers too. too. Piper rules. Thanks, Anthony. You're a good man. Good talking to you. See you next yeah. week. Bye. Bye. Well, he's going to see me next week. I'm kind of scared. <laughs> You're going to be out of town. I hope he's not going to be in the bushes outside your house. <laughs> yeah, we'll be in it. Oh, he must be going to the same convention. I'll be in Atlanta, Days of the Dead, and uh, Roddy Piper will be there. So. Oh, nice. Hopefully that's what he meant. <laughs> Let's see. We got uh, Joel Gomez calling in from Portugal. Hello. Oh, Hello. Buenos dias. Yeah. yeah. Spanish, but yeah. <laughs> yeah buenos dias. Um, yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, it's an my... <laughs> Yes. How dare you? That's not our language. Um, about the uh, specifically this DVD that you're doing with J.J. Dillon, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you've done other DVDs with other four horsemen as well in terms of shoots. Um, did you thought that J.J. Dillon was the more soft-spoken individual of the group? For this particular project, you mean? In terms of you, you have done shoots with other like Ric Flair and um, you know Tully Blanchard. Yeah. And all. We haven't. We 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 didn't. We approached Tully no. to do this, and and we couldn't come to terms. Um, but uh, we had the great we had a great secret weapon, which I think we had overlooked when we went to Tully, and that was JJ. JJ, who yes. was is probably better with the details than a lot of the workers would have been. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. He, not only did he have the, the records there, but he, he's uh, he's got a mind, and uh, like you said, you know some of the guys they were probably more into the uh, the horseman lifestyle. Might not remember all the details what was going on. <laughs> How would I say good day in Portuguese, anyways? Um, the episode, it's it's uh, close. It's oh dear. 
Oh, okay. I just <laughs> yeah. No, I, no, you got an A for an F for effort. Hmm. Uh, oh. now, do you ship? Uh, do you ship kayfabe commentary DVDs to Portugal? Everywhere, all over the world. We actually just uh, partnered with uh, Prestige over in the UK, uh, who launched our uh, our UK site, kayfabe commentaries UK dot com, um, for folks uh, in Europe who. I mean, you can certainly order from us. We still ship all over the world, but mm -hmm. um, it speeds up delivery a little bit. You know, I'm I'm kind of insane about customer service. Our, our customer experience is 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 as much a priority for me as the technical aspect and our production values. I really, and I think anyone who's had to deal with us from a customer service perspective can tell you that it bothered me that the passionate customer here in the United States would have our disc one or two days after ordering um, and somebody in Portugal or Wales would have to wait a week. Now, mm -hmm. it's still pretty good to get your discs over there in a week, mm -hmm. but I, I wanted to do something better. So we talked to the folks um, over there, and, and so now we, we ship directly out of the U.K. so you could have your discs just as quickly um, if you order from kfibcommentariesuk.com yeah. as a U.S. or Canadian customer who would order from uh, the U.S. site. Mm -hmm. I, I want to say not just the graphics of the pop-up on the um, on the Being a Horseman DVD, but I really love the set, uh, the background of the set. I thought it looked great. It's probably Thanks. like the best back, uh, the best like just set I've seen in any street. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. The photos, by the way, in the set were taken by Robert Riddick. Robert Riddick photographed the Carolinas through the 70s and 80s, and maybe even before that. I don't want to take a guess on his age. But he's, he's got a, a massive uh, compendium of, uh, of photographs from all things Carolinas. So we, when we were putting this together, I wanted to get some authentic, um, original yeah. prints of of moments and that shot of JJ leaning you know packing up the, the Cadillac ready to go on the road again hmm. it's actually the cover of our signature edition hmm. that was such a beautiful picture of, of Robert yeah. it really signified what I was trying to capture with this with this release yeah I also like the uh, the uh, pictures of the arenas I like that that was good stuff mm -hmm. and it's hard to find uh, quality photos sometimes of, of that era especially if you're like looking online it, it won't be very good quality stuff yeah, well, no, I wanted to go right to the source. I wanted to get the yeah. high res stuff, and and uh, he he had some great stuff, fortunately. Mm. But you know, I've seen other uh, not kayfabe commentary ones, but I've seen other DVDs where they use pictures I've known that they got off the internet, and the uh, the quality is pretty lacking. It, indeed. Thanks, Joel. Uh, can I? Uh, yeah, go on quick. I just uh, I, I guess I, it's uh, the spinoff of the question that I had was. Um, was J.J. Dillon, you know, in terms of the person, was he similar to the what you expected him to be in terms of his personality? Yeah, I, we worked with J.J. Um, J.J. did a guest booker for us. I think he did uh, guest booker number three. He did our, our third edition of guest booker when we were just getting started, really, in our first year back in uh, 2007. Uh, we brought him back in. Out. Are the members of the Horsemen? <laughs> Gone. Indeed, we sure are. Yeah. Um, and uh, he, we, so we worked with JJ a bunch of times. So so I knew. And plus, reading his book, you'll know that he's he's very very uh, particular about details. And uh, and so yeah, I, I knew he would be perfect for this. I knew he'd be exactly what we needed. Mm. Okay. We've, thank you. Thanks, Joel. Uh, we've had him on three times on the show, and uh, just the one of the best interviews, I think. You could listen to him talk, and he doesn't run out of stories, or there are, there are things to say. He knows so much about psychology and just the history of us. You know, I think about it. J.J. worked in... J.J. worked as a wrestler, of course, first, but then he worked creative in the WWF, wrote television next to Vince and Pat Patterson at Vince's pool for however many years he did that. Worked on camera as a manager of the Four Horsemen, arguably the most famous wrestling stable ever. Uh, 
um, on the competitors' television prior to going to WWF. I'm going in no particular order. Worked in the office for the Crockett's in, at that time, outside of WWF, the most powerful wrestling organization in the country. Worked creative in WCW on the booking committee. At the time, they had their big run against Vince. There's, there's nowhere this guy wasn't in, in the big, the big few federations. Both sides of the camera can tell you stories about the top talent because he was managing them. Can tell you a story about the top decision makers behind the scenes. Really, really, really one of the most valuable sources of wrestling knowledge. Um, very underused, very underappreciated. I mean, the fact that, you know, Vince is putting him in this thing in a couple of months. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I suppose deserving, you'd have to consider the source, but JJ's deserving of any any accolades he gets. He's really, really, really a treasure to the business. Mm-hmm. And he still looks pretty much the same age now as he did uh, back in the Horseman days. He was cryogenically frozen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in eighteen twelve mm. is what nobody knows. And mm. uh, yeah, every every couple of months they pop him out of the tank, and he does a few interviews, and then right back in the tank. Mm. <laughs> so you need a picture of like a like a uh, one of those freezing lockers for your next uh, DVD. With mm. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be our next uh, investigative <laughs> special. Mm. JJ on ice. <laughs> Let's see here. We got a 518 area code. Who are you? Oh, good evening, guys. This is uh, Salvatore in Albany, New York. Uh, I know that we're speaking about this J.J. Dillon DVD, which I do look forward to picking up. However, I know tomorrow there is an announcement for a new You Shoot guest, I think. Yes. And there was, a qu- there was a question I wanted to ask for somebody. I'm hoping it might be. Again, it might not be this person, but uh, there is talks of it maybe happening, but... Uh, there's a question I'd like to ask nonetheless, even if he's not the guest, about Jake Roberts. I'd like that. I know that Sean and I, also some of the hosts, are in my age range. We're, I'm 33. Um, and the beauty of the Internet is we're allowed to see, watch things back that now that we're more worldly and more experienced, we're able to really see the genius of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm also an actor. Uh, and I know Sean is. Um, Sean, if you comment, just as now that you're older and you've been able to watch his promos, uh, what is it that you think that he contributed to the actual modern promo? Um, I'm sure you see shades of, of Jake in Y2J and the, that thing where he doesn't raise his voice. Uh, but there's also certain cues that Jake makes to the camera. Uh, like Michael Caine, sometimes he doesn't, uh, he doesn't blink. Um, I was wondering if you just could comment on that. I was just, I was just gonna say that's, that's very, you must be a good actor. Um, I'm a bit of a good villain, actually. It's a, <laughs> The big secret is that it's all the eyes, um, and uh, and you've got to stay still enough for me to be able to see your eyes. And Don Morocco did that, and Jake did that, and the guys today prance around the ring and they walk around, and all their promos are done not in front of a backdrop, but in front of you know thirty thousand people, and they're on all sides of them. So they turn away, they look away, they look up, they look down. There's lights in their faces, you know, they're dodging flying pretzels. So, you know, nobody cuts a real promo now. They get in a ring and they do a verbal version of what they're going to do in the ring as wrestlers later, which is spar, go back and forth, and it's the give and the take. And nobody really has to think all that much because everything's written for them. They're thinking about their next line probably. So that's what's lost, the ability for a guy to kind of know what they want to say, and the camera goes on, and they're stoic and they're still and they look right into the camera and they speak honestly as honestly as they can conjure up from the darkest part of their soul about the things they're going to do in Madison Square Garden tomorrow night and we were captivated that's what's gone in my mind but I do the old fart thing now I talk about all back in my day and (laughs) But uh, but to answer your question, it's all in the eyes. And when we allow our cameras to get close enough to somebody who's looking right through the lens at us, we can tell a liar and we can tell somebody who's telling us the truth. And most of the guys in 1982 or 84 were telling the truth. If I may add something also, most of the guys back then actually had to sell tickets where now you have a guaranteed contract for a lot of the big guys. So 
it's it's I don't know I'm not really I know there's downsides and everything but I'm not really sure about the pay structure but I think when you're guaranteed a salary that's a little less of an incentive to really I don't know, cut a promo. Uh, then again, you know I'm not a, I don't work for WWE. Well, I, uh, yeah, I mean I don't know how much it plays into the promos, but I can tell you that what it does is it 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 um it, uh, it 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 fosters a feeling I think in a lot of the younger talent that they are entertainment stars and and not necessarily uh god wrestling is such a specialized thing i i always hate it when 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 vince would try to paint it as entertainment and then maybe someone else would try to paint it as sport it's completely unique it can't be judged according to entertainment um it, it's so different and and i the guys now i i, I they're there I mean, they enjoy the wrestling, I guess, but, you know, every girl that gets out of the ring thinks there's a country album coming their way next and, you know, that that's going to be their next plateau. And I don't, I don't think anyone wants to just be a fucking wrestler. Jake Roberts wanted to be a fucking wrestler and a champion cocaine snorter, probably. But that was that was a secret aspiration. Mm -hmm. He just wanted well, to Jake, be a wrestler. Jake, next to, you know, next to that guy from Rolling Stones, might be the greatest white drug taker of our lifetime. You know what? Keith Richards, Jake Roberts, these guys are advertisements for getting yourself so marinated with chemicals that you're, in, you're, you're almost immortal. <laughs> hmm. I couldn't agree anymore. Uh, I don't know if I endorse any of this. <laughs> but that was a good question. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Thank you Salvatore. Thanks, you tell Salvatore sincere. I think I'm not really sure. But I like what you said about wrestling is its own thing. I always thought that was uh, one of the best parts of um, the documentary Beyond the Mat when it opens up and it's how he's explaining what it is because it's hard to explain to somebody if they're not already a wrestling fan. It does go my nerves when people say, you know, it's an action soap opera or it's uh, all these other things. It's it's just wrestling. You can't really compare it to anything else. Yeah. It's like nothing else in the world. And here's here's the one. I was thinking about this the other day on the toilet, as a matter of fact, so I, I can share it with you. It's where I do all my best thinking. And when everyone used to talk about unionizing wrestling, and Vince would always roll his eyes and, you know, those exaggerated, exasperated looks, um... But he, but yet he always goes back to the sports entertainment analogy. Well, in entertainment, we're members of a union. I'm members of SAG, which is a, an actors' union. I'm also a member of AFTRA, which is a television union. So, that, so the entertainment side has union. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the sports. The NBA, the NFL players' union, they all have unions. So that's twice the reason. That performers in the WWE should at least, even if there's not a union, should at least be considered an employee and given an employee's contract as opposed to this um, 1099 independent contractor stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I stepped down from my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> Intro here. He was saying earlier he didn't uh, he didn't uh, condone any of that, but I've been saying on the show for a long time. I think wrestling was at its best with uh, with uh, a lot of cocaine fueled promos and. And most of the guys were all juiced up. Yeah, the, the kids today can't do it. I mean, Jeff Hardy goes out there after, you know, a couple of whatever, and, you know, he can't even work. Mm -hmm. Jake Roberts could get through an entire match in 1986. He's seeing dead relatives across the ring, <laughs> but he's performing eloquently. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, huh. See, intro. That's the secret to the. That's uh, how I perform in the show. We had a pretty fiery promo on Raw by CM Punk and Chris Jericho. So I'm going to stick somebody, to my guns here. Has a question on your uh, on your um, the, in, the, in the chat room here? Yeah, a little gimmick over here this is, <clears throat> about Vader. All right. Ah. On the Ringside DVD, um, Vader did our <laughs> Ringside show, and Vader's an odd cat. Vader sat down, uh, and the 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 whole concept of that show it was the kind of, we would simulate the ringside table, mm -hmm. and uh, you know had the old cheesy '80s microphone foam pads on the mics, the gimmick mics that weren't even plugged into anything, but right. um, 
but it was supposed to be the ringside table, and we were supposed to jump right into the matches. It was a collection of ten matches of that person's career. We want to talk about them in depth as they played on the monitor. So we jump right into the show, and I, I don't know the first match we shot. But I said, okay, here we are down at ringside with uh, Vader, and we're and he's completely thrown. And he turns to me, he goes, "Whoa, whoa wait, 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 wait! You, you're not going to do like a like a hey, you know, good to have you here, man." kind of thing because you know i wanted i wanted to open that way i had some things i wanted to say and i said well you know uh, there was not going to be any kind of formal intro here because we were just gonna i wanted to be like a collection of matches fans could jump around and look at any chapter there's no real start middle end to the show but but it was really important to him so i said you know what fuck it let's do it let's (laughs) open up and you can watch this because this made the final cut I say, well, here we are down at ringside, and and Vader, thank you very much for doing this and being a part of this. I turn to shake his hand, and he just says this. My pleasure, my man. (laughs) (laughs) So I think I'm I'm visibly thrown by Uh by that, by that, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, remarkable and and loquacious uh, 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 response to the line I had to feed him. Mm -hmm. So we go right into the into the action. Now he begins his he has a very very bad back, so he begins to 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 tighten up several times throughout the the session. So he's got to break and do uh, intense stretches and bends and and you know and his energy gets low and and he's got to go get the five hour energy and 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 he he did it he he would talk about the five hour energy endlessly and he went he said i got i actually got some and i need it and i got to go next door so he goes next door he gets the five hour energy he comes back invigorated if you watch the dvd it's the next segment we shoot after the five hour energy is the one where he starts yelling ringside ringside with sean oliver (laughs) when we start the match and i'm like holy shit yeah that's five hour energy halfway through the match he looks like he's ready to fall asleep we finish that match i turn to my what happened to the five hour energy he goes didn't last five hours <laughs> I, I've tried five hour energy. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to do anything. For yeah, me. I had it too, and it felt like my teeth were going to fall out. Yeah, I didn't like it. Red, Red Bull seems to, to to do the trick. I, yeah. uh, those energy things just don't seem to work for me. What else you got? <laughs> Let's see. You're a nine one four area code. Who are you? Sean Oliver. I don't think so. I think he's already on the line. <laughs> Sean, <laughs> Sean Oliver. Is this Gene again? <laughs> are you playing a tape? I've, I've Are you calling it. in with a different phone number just so you can get back on? Now, Gene, we uh, talked I've... about this. <laughs> I'll get Bingo. Uh, creative, so let's hear what he's got to say quick. Bingo, Jackie. How long did, did it take you to <clears throat> think of that one, Jackie Jones? All right, man. What, what do you got for us? Make it some good. Hey, I tell you, I've had, I've had a five-hour energy shot. It didn't give me energy, but it made my cock as stiff as a, a dumbbell. <laughs> I tell you. Thank you for calling in, Gene. That's very, very interesting. <laughs> Thanks, man. Talk to you later. Thank you. No. Man, we really need a call screener. <laughs> I don't know. It kind of, it's kind of fun, I guess. But uh, along the lines of being a horseman, I, I, I he, wrote up some of these He before. said it made it as stiff as what? I don't know. What, what was it stiff as? A dumbbell, did he say? I think so, a dumbbell, yeah. Did he do curls? He could have, yeah. Maybe <laughs> someone did some chin-ups on him. You had a question. I stepped all over you. I'm That's sorry. That's all right. I was saying along the lines of being a horse, but I just want to know uh, these following stables, if you would like to uh, find out what a, a week in the life the of us. Uh, oh, man. I, I don't have the Baldies on here, but we can go right to interest, the Baldies. Well, listen, um, I know where you're going with this, and all I have to tell you is based on pa- on past history, which is redundant. All history's past. Based on history, mm. the WWE should have a disc out called Being DX in about well, would have about six months probably. It would take them to cut it, and you'll see the announcement in six months. Probably take uh, another six out, you know, months mm-hmm. for artwork and distribution. So I think, um, yeah, I think uh, I think you will see more. Uh, probably won't be by us though. Hey, hmm. you, you know, the, the latest, my favorite is now the shirts. They have kayfabe t-shirts. Do you see no, that? I was going to bring that up. Yeah, the kayfabe t-shirts. Uh, I guess uh, Meltzer said that they were going to be pulling them off because some of the, the veterans didn't uh, didn't like the idea that they were selling shirts that use the insider terms. Yeah, I didn't like it either. 
Well, we have a line. We have a line called Heatwear, mm -hmm. which is our uh, our apparel line of T-shirts with kind of edgy insider sayings on them, with with the images of some of the folks we've uh, we've worked with. And uh, I just thought it comical that they come out with a line and and uh, called it kayfabe tees. Mm -hmm. Probably just a coincidence. They weren't very uh, they weren't very well made either. Just a, a basic black shirt with a really like generic white uh, text. Yeah, I was pissed because they uh, devalued our product. People might confuse ours with the shit they put out. Mm -hmm. Hmm. All right. Well, I also had another one here. It was uh, if it would be possible to shoot interview, uh, you shoot whatever with inanimate objects. Objects. Uh, I've got some here. If you'd be interested, uh, the arrogance can. Um, well, of course, you're making reference to uh, Rick the Model Martel's uh, mm -hmm. fragrance, which was just basically, I guess, borrowed from Gorgeous George's entrance when he his valets would spray the ring. Um, yes, I would ask um, how they how the can was able to endure Rick's uh, uh, French Canadian accent for as long as the can did. <laughs> um, I would ask if there are any jokes about uh, that the can would make toward Rick about having held the AWA title um, when they wanted to run against Vince, that they chose him, um, and uh, and a whole host of things I could ask the can. Sure, I would do I would do the can in a heartbeat. All right, uh, let's see. Also, get here we get it. Moppy. Yeah, Moppy, Moppy. That was a whole dumb thing. We we already did we did Saturn. Uh, one of my favorite questions sent in during that U shoot with Perry Saturn, available at kfabecommentaries.com, was who weighed more, Terry or Moppy? <laughs> to which he replied, Moppy. <laughs> 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 and uh, no, I would pass on Moppy. I would uh, do the arrogance can, I would pass on Moppy. All right, let's get a couple more here. The, the broomstick that they say uh, Ric Flair can do a five star match with. Um. Yeah, pass. All right, no, you're out of there. Uh, and uh, Jim Cornette's tennis racket. Oh yeah, well yeah. He when I asked where the handle of that racket was on those crazy nights <laughs> down in the Carolinas, and he said, "Gay Fabe." Uh, I'm going to have to go to the other end of that story. I have to go to the horse's mouth. I want to find out where that's been. Mm -hmm. And the last thank you, one. Thank you for the heatwear link to Boxman, by the way. Oh, there we go. That's heat-wear.com. And uh, last one here I have is Raven's Rhino. Pass on all things Raven. <laughs> all right. <laughs> no, nope. I have to listen to. I'd have to listen to him talk. Scott can talk, man. You know, it's it's. Mm -hmm. You got to clear it, your name. There's you definitely a shortage of uh, Raven uh, DVDs out there too. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the, the other thing too. You really can't find him talking on uh, shoot DVDs about anything of value. Mm hmm. And uh, I don't know if you knew this or not. They chant snotty, uh, too hotty. Uh, he says that story in every DVD I've ever seen. That's why I brought that up. Uh, uh, can we get the, the story on Cole Cabana? What do you want to know? <laughs> no, I, you, uh, you put out a thing. I guess you were gonna, what were you going to do, a shoot? Uh, you shoot with him? Uh, Cole Cabana committed to doing a you shoot. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we made the announcement and began the submission process. And shortly thereafter, did not want to. Uh, said he was up all night with anxiety about it. And, uh, I mean, I can't put a gun to anyone's head. But um, I think all things work out for a reason. And... Uh, we have a big announcement tomorrow night about an upcoming You Shoot Live that you can be there for. And um, maybe it cleared the way for this. Who knows? Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Listen, I, I don't want to get in anyone's way. The guy said he couldn't do the goddamn show. I, I'm, I'm going to make him do the show. Uh -huh. It would be a half ass watered down thing. He'd be probably, you know hesitant to answer stuff and oh. you know maybe you didn't want to talk about punk or you know oh i don't want to talk about this and i don't want to talk. and that doesn't make for a good show you need a guy who's got the balls to come out there and go you know what i am who i am i answer my questions honestly and here you go 
Yeah, and and he didn't want to do that, or maybe he had a booking at a VFW hall in in Portland somewhere. I don't know. Uh, yeah, uh, which which superseded the importance of uh, of this DVD. Yeah. Either way, if he didn't want to do it, I don't want him to do it. I don't want him to come to. Uh, I would never want to go to a party I wasn't invited to, and uh, that's kind of what it would have felt like if I was sitting there with somebody who thought that they were in some way better than this DVD. Was there specifics he didn't want to do? He just didn't want to do the whole thing. Was it like I don't want to ask the, the no, question? No, he, said, he said he said that that he just he he you know after thinking about it and, and watching more of them he he he's got nervous. He, he his quote was I was up all night with anxiety and and I can't I can't do this I I can't do it and 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 that was it and you know there was a little bit of discussion. I offered some ways that uh, he could maybe look at this a little differently. Uh, than he was and listen you know the other thing i've dealt with and I'm, I'm of course not saying it's the case with cm punk i think some of the younger uh generation of workers uh they because of the reasons i outlined before that wrestlers think they're you know entertainment stars mm -hmm. and i don't i don't work in wrestling now i own a production company that deals with wrestling but i'm not in wrestling but i have been a participant in the entertainment industry for almost 20 years and i can tell you that Nobody in wrestling is in the entertainment business. But they all kind of feel that they are, I think. And so there's a lot of thought about how they're going to be perceived and what they're going to do after this. And they kind of look like at keeping options open. And I don't want to be painted the wrong way. When the, when the irony of this, of course, is you look at the workers in wrestling who have been able to work in the ring for whatever, 20 years, 30 years, and then after that have as prominent a presence on the internet, shoot DVDs, get brought back for Hall of Fames and stuff, mm -hmm. and it's all because they're not worried about positioning themselves and all this bullshit about well, you know, their aspirations and what they want to... They say, you know what, I need the exposure, and I'm an interesting enough guy that if I get out there and I'm honest and I tell a few funny stories and I answer the questions how I feel and I'm a stand-up guy and I stand by what I say on every interview, that I'm going to be interesting enough to be interesting to people in shoot interviews, on podcasts, on my website, on my blog, on my books that I write. And they don't fucking worry about the other stuff. And I think the younger generation of wrestler gets tripped up by worrying about stuff that you know what, kid? You're a wrestler. That's about it. You may get a walk on here and there and this and that or whatever, but in the end, you're a wrestler. And in 20 years, you're going to be a broken down wrestler. And you're not going to have your own sitcom. So let's think about being interesting consistently for the next 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. Again, I step off my, uh, my, uh, my uh, soapbox. Mm hmm has anyone else ever uh, watched your who who like uh, maybe you pre approach and said, "Oh, maybe I'll do it." Then they watched some of the ones and said, "Oh, this isn't for me." Um, maybe not just totally agree to do it and then back down. You know what? Uh, <laughs> Colt Cabana and a and a few girls. Hmm. It's no. usually the, the ladies that that get scared away a little bit. And I listen. I understand that they they're thinking about something different. They. You know, they're going to be mothers someday, you know, and, yeah. you know, I understand those kind of concerns. And, you know, when I whip out the dick bag and there they are sitting playing with the dick bag, right. you know, you don't want your kid logging on and seeing that. Yeah. It, so, if, so that I kind of get. If someone uh, specifically said, like, you know, I, I have no problem doing this, there's just one thing I don't want to do, would you be cool with that? Um, there was, or would it depend yeah, who it would be? It would depend what it would be. Maria didn't want to touch uh, out of any of the, uh, the, the, the fake drugs. Mm-hmm from the bag out. She works with the Make-A-Wish Foundation and she didn't want, you know, the kids that are in Make-A-Wish to see her, you know, with a, some guy holding a bag of gimmick pot next to her. And, uh, you know, that that was fine. Um, the only other thing I ever edited out... I mean, I do a lot of editing when I'm sitting there and I'm jumping around based on where the conversation's gone. I'll skip a question and get to something else. But... Um, the, the Dixie shoot, I, I, I nixed a question about her, how she shares her bush. <laughs> I, mean, I, I didn't think that would necessarily get the uh, conversation where I needed it to go. <laughs> right, right. 
I mixed that in, with in, hi- in hindsight, Jack, in hindsight, I should have yeah. asked it. Yeah, you might as well. What the hell? Right. Uh, did you have a question from the board? Yeah, I had a question from second to none. He wants to know, any plans on doing anything with Dynamite Kid? Probably yeah, everybody. You know, I heard rumors that he was going to do something. Mm-hmm. The, the the stark reality of that situation is that Dynamite, from what I understand, is on um, is on public assistance because he's disabled, and um, any bump in income would jeopardize his stability um, to continue to receive that assistance. I'm not sure how it's structured in the UK, but I do know that um, if he took a a big payday, it would uh, it could jeopardize his public assistance, which is why I understand he's he's turned down some uh, attractive offers. Mm. So I, I don't suspect he'll be doing anything. Yeah, uh, <laughs> President Clinton, uh, in your heads, President Clinton. He wants to know: Is Greg Gagne a, a strange guy? <laughs> Our time together was fine. Uh-huh. I, 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 uh, our time together shooting Guest Booker was fine. It was kind of a weird thing. He was actually, people may not know this, uh, the Guest Booker was actually supposed to be Greg and Vern together. Now, Vern wasn't in the greatest of health at the time, but Greg was coming and was flying out with him, and they were both going to sit there. And we were going to do this whole McMahon takeover thing with Vern. I was very excited about this. Um, the, the, this is the kind of shit that that I would I would break my neck running to the computer to order if I heard somebody had put it out. But you know it makes eleven uh, dollars in, in the market. Um, but he was actually too sick to get on the plane, so Greg flew out. Now we sh- we shot the um, we shot the intro prior to them getting there, so I actually had to overdub. If you look at my lips. I say uh, guest booker with the Ganyas, and I actually had to overdub with Greg Ganya over there. I don't know. I guess it matched up well enough. I've never been called on it. But mm. Greg was great. Greg was forthcoming. He was open. His plane was delayed till all fuck hours. He get, got back. I think we shot that at 2 in the morning, and he was great and a great sport. And a few days after that, I called him for some reason. I think I wanted to get him booked on a podcast to promote it I called him he sounded very frazzled I said is this a bad time should I call you back and he said you know what I have a customer and I said okay give me a call back and I never heard from him again I don't know what the customer meant I don't know does anyone know what he does now <laughs> he sells cars yeah, yeah yeah. we had him on the show and he's oh, okay All right. he had a customer <laughs> he, was, uh, he was selling a Chevy or something and, yeah. Yeah. you thought he was up to something else did you <laughs> Except there's some shady, shady uh, shenanigans there. <laughs> oh, I just got a text. I guess James of uh, Legends of the Ring is listening. He just texted me and said, uh, Dynamite is not doing shit. Uh, know that for a fact. Tell uh-huh. them that. So there you go. Straight from James of Legends of the Ring. Um, he ain't doing shit. Legends of the Ring and Kayfabe Commentaries will be partnering up for a very big You Shoot Live, which will be announced tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. So... Um, Hmm. Hmm. It, if we June, guess, would you tell us? No, I can't. June uh, June 1st and 2nd of this year in Monroe, New Jersey, is going to be the place to be unquestionably for uh, for what will be announced tomorrow night and then for what Legends of the Ring has to announce beyond that. Trust me. Okay. Oh, is it the Musketeer? No. What was that answer? <laughs> the Musketeer from ECW. Oh man, that would that'd be some heavy duty stuff. The ECW Musketeer. No, it's it's Glacier. I have to come clean. It's going to be you <laughs> shoot live with Glacier. Blood oh, runs yeah. cold. Yeah. Get your get your VIP tickets so uh, you can ask him a question. Now, where will this uh, where will this announcement be taking place? Right on your website. Yeah, yeah. Well, it'll hit the website. The press release will go out. It'll uh, be on Twitter, Facebook. Uh, it'll be. I can't imagine it not being carried everywhere once it gets out. So you'll definitely know. Mm-hmm. Uh, just real quick, back to Greg Gagne. Was actually when we had him on, he said he said that he considered Miz the current day Nick Bockwinkel, which I just was mind boggled at. 
Holy fuck. Well, they're both white. I guess that's the... <laughs> yes, they are. That's right. The beginning and end for me. Mm. Let's see. Uh, there's a lot of questions here that were in the chat room. Uh, do you have any from good ones from the board? Mm, yeah, I had some from the board here, Jack. Let's see. Oh, what, what's been like the most uncomfortable fan question? Spec Sun sent that one in. Uh, tonight it was it was Gene, but I think, <laughs> I think you mean on you shoot. Um, it wasn't fun sitting next to Bob Holly reading, you know, coming out of my mouth, you know, well, why are you such a fucking pussy and all this stuff. Um, <laughs> who, mind you, one of the nicest guys I ever worked with. Uh, you know, we brought him back in for ring roast. I love Bob. Um, yeah, that, that was you know that was a time that that uh, you know I I for a few moments here and there preferred to be elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Danny Doring seemed like he was there. Like, was he really mad? Like, uh, on that one where you asked right away, like, "Who are you?" He kind of seemed like that kind of rubbed him the wrong way, right, right to begin with. Yeah, that. Yeah, I, it may have. That's that's why we started it that way. <laughs> to get him in the right. Get him in the right mood. Right. But, uh, did you know that would be so uh, heavy on Rat Talk? Did I know that he but, would? Yeah. That. that, um, that because yeah, that, that he, was like pretty much uh, throughout the whole uh, interview. Well, people, I, I'd seen other stuff that he did, and it's it's always been a kind of a. Uh, I think that's a really underrated uh, DVD you guys have out. I loved it. I, I, anyone that's seen it has put it over huge. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's definitely. Well, oh, God damn it, Jack! What isn't a great DVD? <laughs> well, I'm saying oh, yeah. underrated because oh, I think underrated, it's one, yeah. You know, you might you might see it, nothing against Danny Doring, but you know he's not up. He's not like a household name, and you might think, well, I'll pass that one, but it's actually a, a great one to watch. It is. It is. Uh, Some with a real law name. I'm sure uh, you like it working with him since you do quite often. He wants to know, uh, how do you enjoy working with Jim Cornette? Corny's great. Corny knows, Corny knows exactly... Corny knows exactly what we need. So it's very easy for me to give him the uh, the pitch on something. And again, another guy who was big on saving books. The the most special thing about that timeline, 1997 mm-hmm. DVD we put out with him, was that he brought his actual WWE agent journal. So he was able to, every date that I brought up, he was able to refer down to and had notes from if he was the agent in charge the the venue and um all the TVs it's great stuff mm-hmm. uh specs and also wants to know uh did Missy Hyatt flirt with you during the making of her you shoot uh no Missy's professional you know she knows what uh she knows what what she's doing <laughs> believe me she she's a lot smarter than she <laughs> right. than she puts across she yeah. she's she's great she knows but we're oh, listen, I have to be. A, a lot of people don't like to work with her or whatever. I, I in the entertainment business, I've, I've dealt with the most ridiculous personalities in the world. I, I I have no problem dealing with difficult personalities. I think I'm an easy person to get along with, and so I've I, I've I've enjoyed working with Missy. Has every outing been a joy? No, but. Um, I think she's always over delivered uh, in what we've asked her to do. Mm-hmm. And listen, the uh, I was a little shocked that the Missy Hyatt pajama party wasn't nominated for uh, best production of the year. Also, hmm. have you seen that one, Jack? You know what? I don't think I've seen that one. Hmm. I have to get that one out too. Yeah, <laughs> it, or, I think I've seen a clip of it. Uh, is that the one where um, they call it Honky Tonk Man? Yeah, uh, Lacey Von Eric called yeah. uh, Honky Tonk. I think I just saw that clip. <laughs> I've never seen the old... Uh, I definitely would like to see it, though. Because, Bet you uh, would. Mm, <laughs> I'm getting all excited about it right now. <laughs> now. Now that the man is gone from uh, TNA, would there be any chance of a, uh, a guest booker with uh, Vince Russo? I think there'd be a, a very good chance of that, yeah. Mm. Oh. Be, I, I think that would be a, a good seller. Mm. Me too. Mm-hmm. I'd like to see it. 
I think I think I think most people would like to see it. <laughs> they might not they might not want to admit it, but I think even the people that really dislike him would want to see it. There's, there, listen, for all the Vince Russo talk about him, there's one thing that is undeniable. He was in charge of the creative product during the biggest wrestling boom period in the last 20 years, period, end of story. For that reason alone, he historically has got to be on Guest Booker. Mm -hmm. He's got to discuss that era. It was very important. His jump to WCW was the most talked about thing in the wrestling news for weeks. And a ratings driver, even if temporarily, a ratings driver. His decisions during, before, uh, during, in, in, and after that boom period continue to be a hot topic. Everyone talks about Russo. Mm -hmm. So, I, yeah, I think he should be given an opportunity to respond. I think before Russo, I don't think any, like, uh, besides, like, real hardcore fans even knew who the Booker was or what a Booker was. I mean, you never heard anyone chanting a, a Booker's name at any of, any other promotion. Absolutely, yeah. He really broke that fourth wall. And, uh, again, I say for better or worse. I'm not, you know, standing here putting him over, but um, he, for what it's worth, he made the shoot side of wrestling uh, mainstream, mm -hmm. and uh, that that added a dimension to wrestling that allowed it to kind of be born again. You know, all products kind of have to go through a facelift. Kiss had to take off the makeup, tease up their hair, and run around like they sucked dick <laughs> in the early '80s. And uh, you know, then they had to change again and get back into the um, into the makeup and, and do their thing again. So mm -hmm. all products have to change, and I think Vince was a big uh, conduit for that. No, let's see. There's a million here on the Facebook. I also asked a good one. Uh, my Madman Maple wants to know, and I read this on your board, so I think it's coming out soon, but he wants to know what happened to the Breaking Kayfabe interview with New Jack. It's coming out. The, the series is launching, uh, I have it right here, June 19th. Uh, Breaking Kayfabe is going to be a, another series. We shot the New Jack one. Um we wanted to get enough of them in the can to be able to structure, you know, a proper, proper release schedule. We're actually shooting one with uh, Sid Vicious in a couple of weeks, and there'll be one with Sean Waltman, which is on the schedule to be shot. The, the pitch for that show, by the way, is that it's uh, it's about the people. We've seen shoot interviews that talk ad nauseum about. You know what went on in the ring and what, but we never we don't really spend a lot of time trying to find out anything about the person that created that character. And we often hear about how how much the character resembles the actual person. Well, we'll see that. We'll put that to the test with with Breaking Kayfabe. It's me and the guest in kind of a more typical talk show setting, maybe reminiscent of a Larry King or a Charlie Rose setting, and. um it's about the people. It's about the people I'm sitting across from. It's about Sid Udy. It's about Jerome Young and and what he endured as a child and a young man, which got him to this point. Witnessed his mother being shot by his father while she was holding him wow. as a baby. I mean, heavy, heavy stuff. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I didn't really intend it to be a uh, therapy session, but, you know, the, the, I was shocked to see uh, New Jack's tears flow, but it, 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 that pilot that we shot really showed us all in the room that this is a viable show. We need to spend time in our slate dedicated to taking down the characters and, and taking down the in-ring work and talking about the people because the people in the wrestling business just getting to know them as I have as people are unquestionably the most interesting people I have ever dealt with. Entertainment business, this business, anywhere. Their okay. lives are interesting. I don't know if you've uh, filmed the, the Sid one yet, but uh, Sid's a really open guy, so I think that one will be a really good uh, DVD. 
Yeah, it should be. We're shooting it in a couple of weeks. Hmm. Yeah, he's even just called into the show a few times. He's a really good guy. Let's see, uh, Brains wants to know uh, what's your opinion on the closure of Mega Upload and the closure capping of download speeds of other hosting sites. And have you seen, or do you think this will result in a boost in sales from it? I talked about this, I think, with you guys uh, either last time or maybe mm-hmm. the time before that, when I said, and if you pull the, no such thing as tape anymore, I guess, you pull the, <laughs> the ones and zeros, you'll hear me say this. I said that piracy is the fault of the big corporations who, when they were not being affected, ignored it. And now that big companies, computer co- companies with computer interests, now have content producing entities, oh, they're suddenly so concerned about this. So I said, what you'll start to see is they'll start to monitor this at the host level. Um, th- they will start to look at download sizes and download speeds, and this is what they'll start to cap. And sure enough, that's exactly where this is going. Nobody gave a shit when it was the talent that was losing money, the bands, you know, a couple of pirated albums here, pirated albums there. That's the bread and butter for, for the performers. But now that these these companies have mixed interests and you have look at it, look at someone like AOL Time Warner with with entertainment entities and computer entities, now suddenly there's there's all this emphasis on how to cap piracy. Do I think we'll see sale, uh, a, a dip in sales from it? I don't know that it's really going to affect it. I said last time I was on it, I don't want to be redundant. The, the people who are pirating our stuff, they are fans. Mm-hmm. They're not putting Neil Diamond albums up there that they're not going to listen to. <laughs> right. They're putting stuff up that they think is worthy of other people seeing. So it's a bizarre backhanded compliment to us. They're sharing our stuff because they think it's great. The pirates are fans too. So you've got you've got, you've got a big responsibility as a as a producer of digital content these days to to see that your that the piracy is controlled, but also understand that that the answer isn't vilifying necessarily the people that do it. Mm-hmm. There is kind of a thumbing your nose at authority. Fuck you! Look what I can do. Attitude to these guys. Um, but when you strip all that stuff away, that they're sharing it because they like it. Mm. So. And it's so easy now that uh, I think some people don't even realize there's anything wrong with it because it is so easy to do. They don't. Yeah, people who grew up in this digital age, they their entire lives, they thought that because something was digital and on a computer, it was inherently right to have it for free. They really believe that in their heart of hearts. So just like someone my age and your age, it's tough to bend our heads around the concept that, hey, wait a minute, man, they're, they're given, they're just given these albums away. Nobody buys these CDs anymore. Yeah. Well, it's equally tough for them to bend their minds to get around the fact that, wait a minute, art has to be paid for if it's commercial. Mm-hmm. But and, and and in the end, we're all going to lose because what we're going to what's going to happen now is we're going to sit through commercials on DVDs. I mean, this is where it's all going to head clearly. And I don't mean at the head of the DVD in the middle of the DVD so that yeah. they can so that the count that they can give to advertisers is not how many are sold but how many are out there they're going to say yeah man listen Coca-Cola even though our product is pirated by half as many people that buy it they're still going to see your ad in the middle of the DVD it's the only way around it so they're going to begin to advertise on DVDs now and this is the kind of nonsense that we're going to head for because piracy abounds Mm-hmm. No, maybe we'll see some RC. You guys drinking RC Cola on U shoots or something? Yeah, maybe we'll see. Uh, was, anyone wants to sponsor? Um, you know, I'm just uh, sending your requests. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I just want to ask one of these guys questions because he sent in about six of them. But uh, I see Tittle. He says wants to know thoughts on Tom Brandy's racist set on the Iron Cheek roast. Uh, I don't. Oh, someone's gonna have to. Fresh my memory. I don't think he did a, a racist set. <laughs> okay. Did he? I... I, you know what? He did one thing. You know. Okay, I remember what he did. He he told a story about the Iron Sheik. It wasn't him. It was the Iron Sheik. Mm-hmm. He said that the uh, the Iron Sheik was unhappy with something that uh, Tony Atlas did in the ring at an indie show, and he got back to the locker room and said to Brandy, uh, 
you know, Tony Atlas and Mr. USA, a great man, big, strong, but get him in the ring, typical N-word. And he was telling the story about the Sheik saying it. I don't think uh, Randy said hmm. All right. So, yeah, he had a mix-up there. It was IC title, not IC title. And uh, Go Go 13, he wants to know, uh, any chance of uh, you giving any thought of a Dave Meltzer uh, on a U-shooter or some type of DVD? Yeah, you know, I've talked back and forth with Dave a few times. We've never been able to line anything up. I think it's... I think it's something he would entertain, and he said he would, in, in, in just in theory. We never got really down to brass tacks. And, uh, um, but, yeah, no, it, it's something that we would definitely do. Yeah. All right. Uh, Andrew, did you have anything uh, else you want to ask? Hmm. You just took my question, but <laughs> oh, okay. uh, but I did want to ask, did you have anybody else in mind for, like, the, the, the four horsemen format that you just pulled off with J.J. J. Dillon? J- uh, just... Tully, when we when I had first uh, thought of the idea, yeah, and um, I think you meant like uh, anybody another, else, another like one in Cornette the series. or something. Oh, in a format? No, WWE is going to pick it up now. We've already put one out, so now it's their turn. They're they're going to go out and do Being DX <laughs> or, or or something uh-huh. similar. <laughs> Being the Mexicals with Hoovy. What's that? Being the Mexicals with Hoovy Two Guerrero. Is that that would be in maybe a big barbecue setting there. That would be good. Yeah. That would be good stuff. Mr. Bases <laughs> start flowing. Uh-huh. All right, man. We well, thank you for coming back on. No, thanks for having me. It's uh, It's been fun. You guys are great. Your fans are great. Thanks, man. Appreciate yeah. it. All right. And we hope to do it again sometime in the near future. All right, guys. As long as you're not sick of us. <laughs> Not, not yet. We'll see. We'll see. Oh, listen, only, only if Gene calls in three times. Next he's time. he's been calling in uh, d- during this uh, this whole show here, but I have not been answered. Let's <laughs> got into Gene tonight. Uh, if, if you're gonna do it, I kind of like like the creativity of doing it, but you should at least have something like planned that you want you want to say. That's the thing, man. He he gets the pop, but he can't deliver once he's in the ring, man. Mm-hmm. Come on, Gene. No something substance. To work, something to work towards. We we'll exactly. give him, we'll give him some. Uh, some encouragement. It's kayfabecommentaries.com, dot com, mm-hmm. and uh, we have something for everyone. If you like the historic element to shoot style DVDs, we've got stuff like timeline history of WWE, timeline history of ECW, uh, study of wrestling's most creative minds, guest Booker. Then, if you like kind of the more salacious, fast-paced, comical, uncensored stuff, we've got you shoot. And then tomorrow, eight p.m., big announcement for you shoot live. Excellent. And I'm not just saying this because you're on here, but honestly, it's like uh, by far the best quality of any kind of shoot interviews you're going to get. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, and anyone's endorsement uh, is fine with me because we all kind of uh, we're all kind of in the same boat. I do I do as many internet radio shows and podcasts as I can because that passion that we all share. Um, that allows us to dedicate as much time as we do to these things without making zillions and millions of dollars um, is shared by all of us. We're kind of kindred spirits in that way. And um, we do it really for the love of this bizarre thing that we found when we were kids um, called pornography. I called uh, professional wrestling. <laughs> Good old action soap operas. There you go. <laughs> what? Well, uh, Sure. Why would you want to go out off us? Uh, why would you want to call yourself soap operas when that's like this dying uh, entity? It's I like, don't know. Who, it's I, almost completely like gone. I think that's something that that these snarky media coverage of wrestling in the '80s probably coined.